Good morning, everyone. As Jeremiah said, my name is Ann Miles, and I'm the Chief Program Officer at Fair Chance. Join the meeting. Um, so uh, Fair Chance, in case you don't know much about Fair Chance or its history, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Fair Chance was founded in 2002. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our mission is to strengthen community-based nonprofits to achieve life-changing results for children, youth, and families in communities impacted by racism, discrimination, and poverty. Each year, we select nonprofits whose work aligns with our mission, and we provide them with free, comprehensive capacity building support to improve their infrastructure, sustainability, and growth. At Fair Chance, we envision a world where every child succeeds. We have worked with over 120 nonprofits in DC and Prince George's County. And in a little bit, you're gonna to get to hear firsthand from one of our alumni partners about the Praxis Partnership experience and benefits. First though, I wanna tell you about the partnership and I wanna start with who it is that we partner with. So the nonprofits that we partner with transform the lives of children, youth, and families by working to achieve outcomes that have proven to be indicators of being on a pathway out of poverty. Also, our partner organizations and their leaders are at a point where they are ready to invest in capacity building. First, we select partners who are working towards outcomes in education, health and well-being, housing and income, and community. We also ask that these organizations serve one of the following populations, parents and infants, early childhood, childhood and adolescents, or young adults up to the age of 24. So the outcomes, what's listed in purple, those are just examples. Um, you're not required to work in a specific set of outcomes, but we do wanna make sure that your organization, the ones that we partner with, are working in the areas listed on the left in black, education, health and well-being, housing and income community, um, with the groupings of participants that are listed across the top, parents and infants, early childhood, childhood adolescents, and young adults up to the age of 24. So there are two important things to take away from this slide. We're looking for organizations that are working with children and youth or parents and guardians who are experiencing poverty in DC, but all of your participants do not have to be experiencing poverty. You do need to know how many are, what percentage are. And then the second thing is you don't have to be an organization whose mission specifically addresses one of these domain areas but you do have to have programming that works towards participant outcomes in these domain areas. So for example, your mission could be about music or dance or painting, as long as the arts are a vehicle through which you're improving, for example, academic outcomes or physical health. So another point about who we partner with is the timing. Um, sort of where you are in the life cycle, your organizational life cycle. So Sally, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this image depicts a generalized trajectory of many nonprofits. It starts with an idea in stage one, the organization is growing in stage two, and then later moving to a stage here at stage four, where the organization needs to figure out, is it still meeting the needs of the community? And can it continue to be sustainable? If not, the organization needs to either renew itself and go back to stage two or close. The image also depicts the type of capacity building that's needed at different stages. So fair chances capacity building partnership programs are designed for organizations that are stage two and they're ready to invest in infrastructure development. This is why our partnership eligi eligibility requirements include criteria such as having programs that have been running for at least one year in DC. Our partnerships are not about helping you create your programming. It's not about helping you, it, instead it is about helping you build your infrastructure. Um, and because the infrastructure needs are different 
for different organizations that are moving out of stage one and entering stage two versus organizations that have been developing their infrastructure and are in the middle or towards the end of stage two. That's why we have two different programs. We have Praxis and we have Pathways. So the Pathways program is for organizations that are focused on building foundational knowledge and infrastructure. Um, and typically Pathways partner organizations are smaller. They have budgets from about $50,000 to $250,000. And they're looking to transition from a founding board, building leadership, staff, and increasing fundraising. So if you, if you think that you fit for Pathways, the Pathways application will be open in the spring. But today we're focusing on Praxis and the Praxis partnership. So just before we go on, just wanna make sure, does anyone have any questions about anything that we've covered so far? If you do, please type your questions into the chat. All right. Sally, shall we go on? So what is the Praxis Partnership? You can go to the next slide. So capacity building is a term that gets used a lot and it means many different things. Our definition of capacity building is that it strengthens the management, governance, and performance of nonprofit organizations so they can better achieve their missions and have greater social impact over time. The Fair Chance Praxis Partnership is the type of capacity building where you get somebody by your side, a coach, a resource, a thought partner, to help you navigate what's needed for your organization to succeed. Some important things to understand about the Praxis Partnership. Our capacity building is done in partnership with executive directors. This results in work designed to meet the unique needs of each nonprofit, but also ensures that leaders have the knowledge, skills, and confidence needed to build and use systems, tools, and processes after the partnership is completed. Partners work with one capacity building specialist during the partnership. However, that capacity building specialist has a plethora of resources and support from Fair Chance's entire team. We understand small nonprofits, which is why our services are free and customized. A nonprofit industry best practice, so to speak, may not be actually the best practice for your organization. And we make sure to work with, alongside you to create solutions that work for your unique context and your unique situation. So there are also things that our partnership is not. So please note, we're not consultants. We are capacity builders. It means we don't do the work for you. We do the work with you. We do the work together. The success of any partnership is going to depend on how much the executive director and the board put into the work. This is why some, it's important to consider before um, applying. Do you plan to be focused on working on your organization's systems, procedures, and policies in the next year? Is learning and working in a virtual setting right for you? Another note about timing. If an organization is in financial crisis, it's not the right time for a partnership. If you're worried about keeping your doors open, it's very, very difficult to have bandwidth to focus on capacity building. You're focused on survival. Additionally, the partnership is not a, a way to take something off of your plate. So as I said, our capacity building specialists are not consultants, they're there to support you and to make getting those things done easier by having a coach, by being a guide, and by being a sounding board. And then lastly, while we engage your board and staff in the work as needed, depending on what we're working on, you cannot delegate partnership work to them. So we work primarily with the executive director. So this slide really shows the capacity building areas that we typically work in. So typically Praxis partners are organizations with budgets between $250,000 to about a million dollars. They have paid staff and are looking to strengthen infrastructure across four or more of these areas. Go to the next slide. 
Anne, can I ask a question? Sure. So we're, uh, we have a budget of about 160,000. So does that automatically mean that we fall under pathways as opposed to praxis? Or if we're, if we, I feel like we're at a level that we're in a stage to strengthen management governance and performance that we're established enough. Mm -hmm. so. it, it is not an automatic. It, it is not a hard and fast. What I would recommend is that you um, sign up for a consultation session with Anjali Nagpal, who is the director of the um, program. And you can just talk about your situation. She can ask you some questions and you can figure out together which might be a better fit but it's definitely not an automatic cutoff. Okay, how do I reach Aunt Angeli? So we can uh, type her information into the, into the chat, but um, she's also listed on our, on our website. And I believe, Sally, am I correct? Or Jeremiah, am I correct? That you can sign up through the website for, for a consultation session? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you so much. It looks like Sally is showing where to do that. Okay. So the partnership timeline, uh, the Praxis partnership timeline begins with an organizational assessment, and this assessment determines an organization's strengths and areas of uh, for improvement across the eight uh, capacity building areas. After the assessment, a work plan is created that focus on, focuses on four of the areas and establishes the goals that the executive director and the capacity building specialist will work to achieve over the course of the partnership. Our partnerships do require a considerable investment of the executive director's time. We expect EDs to devote eight hours per week to partnership work Two of those eight hours will be in virtual weekly meetings with their capacity building specialist. The partnership is hard work, but it is really, really rewarding. We hold a graduation event at the end of the partnership to celebrate your success as a cohort. And after the partnership, Praxis partners are required to complete an annual survey for four years. This survey helps us tell the story of the impact of our work. And then finally, alumni, once you graduate from a partnership, you have access to ongoing support through, um, through our alumni network services program. So some of the things that we offer currently in the network services program is we maintain a listserv that's called the e-forum. Executive directors can ask each other questions and share resources with one another. We host uh, uh, community of practice uh, events where executive directors can come together um, throughout the year. They're typically focused on uh, a topical partner uh, topic that is pertaining to nonprofits. We offer pro bono legal counseling provided by Hogan Levels. And then we also offer continued capacity building support through our alumni resource and capacity hub um, and through some other uh, partnerships that we have, one in particular with the Boston Consulting Group. So while there are many capacity building opportunities out there in, in the DC area, um, there aren't many like ours. The time commitment, the one-on-one -on -one relationship, the community and the cost, right? You can't be free, um, pays off in multiple ways. Our results have consistently shown that within a few years of a fair chance partnership, nonprofits go on to double their budgets and double the numbers of children served. And then while these numbers are powerful, our partners tell their story the best. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jeremiah, who's going to introduce one of our recent Praxis graduates. So in summation, Praxis is a 12-month partnership, which will run from June 2023 to May 2024. It focuses on board development, financial management, fundraising, human resources, leadership and management, outreach and communications, planning and strategy, and program evaluation. 
up to two, up to eight hours of week, eight hours of work per week, two hours with a CBS, who's a capacity building specialist in virtual working space, independent working assignments between sessions, yearly evaluation surveys for four years post partnership are required. Before I introduce our alumni speaker, today we have with us our amazing Praxis team members. We have amazing capacity builders with years of experience leading small nonprofits and expertise in organizational development. I'm going to give you a brief background of our alumni speaker. Our alumni speaker today is Lamont Brown. As an international music artist, engineer, and activist born in Washington, D.C., Lamont Mr. Image Brown found a passion for music at a very young age. Now, with more than 15 years of music experience, writing, producing, and performing, Mr. Image continues to imagine, excuse me, continues to use his passion for the arts to inspire young people around the world. Prior to releasing his debut album, The Melanin King Project in 2015, Lamont founded the Swaliga Foundation in 2012 to connect schools, businesses, and universities in an effort to improve the lives of youth around the world through STEM, through STEM, STEM science, tech, engineering, arts, and math education. Combining his passion for music with his academia background as an architectural engineer, where he earned his degree in Bachelor's of Science 2012 from Drexel University. Upon returning home to DC, Mr. Amaj began volunteering in statistical, st statistically some of the most violent neighborhoods in the country. Prior to releasing his international celebrated solo debut album, The Mel Melanin King Project 2015, Lamont founded the Swalik Foundation in 2012. In an effort to empower young through science, tech, engineering, arts, and math education, combining his passion and talent for music with his academic knowledge as an engineer, Mr. Image developed the STEAM, the block curriculum to get young people interested in STEAM education. Recently featured on TEDx Mid-Atlantic, Lamont has become a pioneer in the field of STEAM education by creating a new subgenre known as STEAM Hip Hop, which has earned him the nickname, the STEAM MC. Mr. Amaj creates hip hop EPs as part of the curriculum to share with the Swaliga tribe of learners in schools in 12 countries across six continents. So Lamont will be joining very shortly. Um, just in the interim, I am Sally Lampron. I'm the research and evaluation manager here at Fair Chance. You've heard a couple of things about surveys. That's you'll get pestering from me. And as Jeremiah mentioned, we do have some of our Praxis team members on the call. Nisha, I don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself really quick while we have a moment. Yes. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see. Everyone, I am Anisha Sashtev, and I am a capacity building specialist working with our nonprofits um, that have joined the Praxis Partnership for the last two years I've been with Fair Chance. So I'm excited to see all the interest in the partnership. Just while we wait for Lamont, does anybody have any questions or is there anything that uh, anything else that we can elaborate on?
I see a hand raised. Yes. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Kritika Goshen. My question is, could you expand on the eight hours a week required, um, you know, in terms of work and what that would look like other than the two hours with the um, the development specialist that you had mentioned? And also, does that take into account that, you know, in the nonprofit sector, folks are still taking time off and, you know, might be going away on vacations and things like that? So how does that work? That's a great question. Nisha, would you mind answering that since you're a part of that intimately? <laughs> That's a great question. So there, we obviously adjust, it's an average of eight hours. So um, in reality, that might look like a little bit more some weeks, a little bit less given the holiday vacation schedule. So we definitely work around and find time that mutually works with the ED and the capacity building specialist. So there are more formal two hour meetings a week where we are really working towards a work plan that we've established in the beginning of the partnership. And then the remaining hours are usually hours outside of those formal meetings where you're working on actively working on some products or some of the movement and capacity building that we've really established in those two hour meetings. So it's all an extension of your work as an ED to help build that capacity of your organization. And so it doesn't often doesn't feel like a separate one off. You're giving five hours outside, but it's um, intertwined with the work that we're set in the work plan if that's helpful. Yeah, thanks, Nisha. Um, just to follow up then, is the primary, like um, the work that'll happen, is it primarily between the, 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 the partnership development specialist and the ED, or will there also be opportunities uh, to interact with like the other folks in the, um, in the program? And if so, how often does that take place? So that's, that's a great question. It's really dependent on what your work plan is. And there's some areas that might require feedback from your staff members. I'd say a majority of the time, the capacity building specialist works just directly with the ED and the board chair um, where it's needed for some of the board governance or for some um, like, for example, one of the partners I'm working with is developing their ED evaluation. And so that's really run by the board and the board chair. So I, I work, you know, with the board chair on some of those pieces. And so I would say interface, it's, it's mostly with the ED, but there are times that the ED might bring another staff member that's going to implement some of the work that we've been working on or to get feedback on some of the work. Um, and we do attend board meetings sometimes to give updates or to help support the ED on some initiatives that we might be working on. Um, so, so that's kind of the broad, mostly it's with the ED, I guess, in, in short, and, and the board chair. I'm happy to answer any questions of taking what we've, the great information that we've learned and, and thinking about what that looks like in pra practice also. Jeremiah, I'm going to suggest, since we're still waiting for Lamont to, to come on, why don't we move forward? And then after this next section, section he, can, he can jump in. Sure, that works. Okay. Okay, we're going to move to application processes and tips. Are there any questions about the process? Okay. Well, I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. So why don't we okay. go to that first? And Sally, if you could read the questions out loud and then. Uh, 
I have to find my controls. <laughs> uh, so the first question was um, just checking. It looks like you don't work with organizations that are fiscally sponsored. Is that correct? Um, and that is correct. We do one of the eligibility criteria is that your organization has a 501c3. Um, and uh, further comment was shared that, you know, it seems like the types of organization organizations we're aiming to support would include some with fiscal sponsors. So it's a, something for us to consider. And we are in a space of consideration. So that is helpful. Thank you. Uh, and then the second question was, how many Praxis partners will be selected for the 2023-2024 cycle? And we are hoping to bring in four new partners with our Praxis groups this year. Uh, and then we have a new question about a co-director model for the board. So we have two board chairs. Uh, would you work with both? Um, and I, I can take a stab at answering that. Um, Anjali Nagpal, our director, is definitely the best person to answer that, but I'm pretty sure I have a beat on it. Um, so we, we do flex with organizations as we can. It is typically one person, but we work with your leadership structure. So if it is co-board directors, we would work with whoever needs to be worked with. Um, we also um, can work with a board representative if your board chair is um, not available to go as in depth as they need, or if the board work is more relevant to a, a different board representative, we can also work with a board representative, which is a different answer than you were asking. Um, but that just shows the flexibility we have in working with your leadership and your leadership model. Yep. And I, um, I will co-sign on what <laughs> Sally just shared. Um, and it's mostly around the assessment time that it's important that both board chairs are available. And then usually with the work plan, we we have specifically roles and responsibilities. So we would talk through with the ED and the board chair who would make the most sense for point person or both. So we're, we've are we had models where we've had co-EDs and we've had multiple board, board members that might not be the board chair that, that um, have a responsibility in some of the work plan. So we work around that. And I, I just want to um, say also with the, the question about fiscal sponsorship, you know, my understanding is that that we have not done that to date. Um, but as I hope you're sort of hearing throughout this information session, like we have, there's no hard or fast and there's we, there's a lot of flexibility. My recommendation would be to um, schedule a consultation session with Anjali. Um, and and talk it through with her because there there might be some indications um, and some information that you share in the way in which your fiscal sponsorship is set up and designed um, that could be a good fit for a praxis partnership. So I would I would always recommend to to you know make your case with her. Oh, and I see another question in the chat. Um, this question may be off subject, but I've also seen a similar template program run in connection with Learn24. So is it the same program? It is not. And yes, we actually are uh, doing a Learn24, starting a, a Learn24 program this morning. There's an orientation happening in a few minutes. Um, it is not the same. It is not the same program. Uh, it, the Learn24 program is not an intensive partnership program. It is a workshop-based program. Um, and so, for example, in this next cycle, we are doing a series of workshops that are focusing specifically on uh, financial management. Um, and so it is a cohort of, I believe, five organizations who will have a monthly workshop uh, led by two of our capacity building specialists. And then in between each workshop, there is a 90 minute coaching session. So, and that coaching session is really geared towards how to um, implement or integrate uh, some of the tools and some of the learnings that are delivered in the workshop. So it's not nearly as intensive. There is no assessment process. 
Um, there's not a work plan that is developed. Um, it is an introduction to uh, fair chance and to, and, and to our partnership model. Our alumni speaker has joined, so if we can hold all questions um, until after he speaks, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> now I would have to do, uh, I'd like to do a brief um, introduction um, to Lamont Brown. Again, Lamont Brown is an international music artist, engineer, and activist born in Washington, D.C. Lamont, Mr. Um, Mog born, Brown found a passion for music at a very young age, now with more than 15 years of music experience, writing, producing, and performing, Mr. Amag continues to use his passion for the arts to inspire young people around the world. Prior to releasing his debut album, The Melanin King Project in 2015, Amag founded the Swaliga Foundation in 2012 to connect schools, businesses, and universities in an effort to improve the lives of youth around the world through STEAM, science, tech, engineering arts and math education, combining his passion for music with his academic background as an architectural engineer. Now, please to welcome Lamont Brown. Peace. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Happy to be here. So I um, think I'm here to describe my experience as a Praxis partner and just my experience with Fair Chance overall. Um, to give you a, a bit of background, um, as you said, my name is Lamont. A lot of people know me as Mr. Image or Mr. IMAG, the STEAM MC. Um, I'm an artist and music has always been my passion, but I also found a passion for working with young people. Uh, through the work that I do. And that led me to found the Swaliga Foundation. And I always tell people I never planned on starting a nonprofit. I never even planned on being a teacher. Um, it's something that chose me, uh, but it, it's something that I, I do really love. And I'm grateful for the partnership that we were able to establish with Fair Chance. Um, the reality is that you know, running a nonprofit is not easy, as I'm sure many of you already know. And one of the things for me was uh, just figuring out how to get out of the way, I like to say. Um, as a founder, you know, I have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of visions. I'm sure there's a lot of founders on the call with us today. Um, but my organization had gotten to the point um, approaching a, a decade, 10 years of service, where I realized that capacity building wasn't even an option anymore. Like we needed to set up some structure, set up some processes to help get us to the next level. And that's one of the things that uh, we were able to do with Fair Chance. So we actually did the Pathways Partnership first, uh, which is the six month partnership. And please correct me if I'm uh, wrong. And we then we did the Praxis Partnership, which is the full year uh, partnership, uh, working with some amazing capacity building specialists. And it, it was a great experience. Now, what I will say is that um, it is fast paced. The time went a lot faster than I would have liked, <laughs> um, but definitely a lot of a lot of value there. And uh, one of the things that I would suggest um, in going into the partnership is uh, one, to keep an open mind. You know, there, there's a lot that we don't know. There's no other way to say it. There's a lot that we don't know. But I would also say to narrow your focus, you know, like capacity building is a very broad term and it means different things for a lot of different people. So going into it, it's more help it's helpful to have a better idea of what you would like to see the outcome be for your organization um so for us in this most recent uh praxis partnership going into it we had 
no HR set up. We didn't have a payroll system. We didn't have a way to log hours. Um, we didn't even have an employee handbook, I don't think. So that was just one example of something that we were looking to add uh, to our organization that we were able to do successfully. Um, we also talked a lot about fundraising and development. You know, there were so many tools that we didn't even have in our toolkit um, that I didn't even know that we needed. You know, things like capability statements and, you know, other uh, development documents that um, a lot of people use to get funding. And if you don't know, you don't know. Before, we were just pretty much winging it. Um, and then after the partnership, um, a lot of the ideas and things that we had were on point, but now just had a lot more intentionality behind it. Um, and that has led to increased success. You know, this is something that uh, we've used. A lot of the tools that were developed during this partnership, we still use. And just, again, continue to help us not only improve the quality of our service, but made us a stronger organization. Um, and the last thing I want to add is that, you know, when you're paired with the capacity building specialist, um, whoever you get, definitely uh, make sure you use that person as a resource. And that takes a level of trust, you know, but it, it's it's definitely in the long run, something that's going to just help your overall mindset. I think that's one of the things that I gained from the partnership as well, is just um, shifting my mindset around not only what was possible, but what we needed to do to get there. You know, and that, that's an important thing to keep in mind because a lot of this is mental. You know, a lot of the work that we do uh, takes a very unique mental fortitude, I'll say. Um, so, yeah, again, definitely grateful for um, the partnership. It is a lot of work. I, I will say that as well. It, it does take a certain level of time commitment, um, but it is definitely worth it. It's definitely a valuable resource. And you you can make the most out of it. So thank you to everyone uh, for having me. Thank you for uh, letting me share more about my experience. Are there any questions for Lamont? Remember, you can type your questions into the chat if you do not want to speak on the recording, and I will read it aloud for Lamont. Okay. We will move forward. If you have questions for Lamont, please place them in the chat. Oh, okay. We have a question. Yep. Someone's asking Lamont, how did you manage your time being involved in the program? Mm, that is a great question, Mr. Tim Whedon of Tech Turn Up. So, to be completely honest, that was one of the difficult parts uh, for me, um, being a ED of a young organization. Um, time is precious, you know, and, and there's a lot to get done in a quick amount of time. So uh, one of the things that we did, and this is something I worked on with my capacity building specialist, was um, just carve out a certain amount of hours each week so there's a certain amount of time where you're actually meeting, talking with your capacity building specialist. But in that, there's going to be homework. There's going to be other things that have to be done outside of that time. So you have to carve out time for that as well. So it may be two hours a week, depending on what you're working to get done. It may be four hours a week outside of the time that, you know, you're meeting with your capacity building specialist. Um, so again, it is a big time commitment. You know, this this isn't, um, you get what you put into it, right? So 
it, it took me a while to figure out that rhythm on, on top of all the other things that I was already doing. Um, but carving out that time in my schedule intentionally um, helped me to get things done a lot faster. So um, you you definitely have to be very, um, very strict with your time. I, I would say that, um, but it definitely helps. There was another question. Um, what was one of the biggest problems you solved during the partnership? Mm, biggest problem. So with Praxis, I would say, as I mentioned, we worked a lot on our HR documents and processes for our organization. We also did a lot with finance. Um, there were a lot of tools that we did not have in our tool belt in terms of financial management, um, bookkeeping, um, and again, process is a big thing. Anytime we're talking about capacity building now, that's really what my mind goes to is process. Like you're you're going to be asked a lot of questions. You're going to be asked if you have a lot of documents. Uh, we didn't have most of them, but after <laughs> the partnership. Uh, we definitely were able to get some of those things in place. Um, I would say one of the main differences is that I got an assistant. I didn't have an assistant going into this. And the more we talked, um, you know, the the question became, well, why isn't somebody else doing this? You know, because it, it was just very apparent that in my process and in, in my work, um, that I needed help administratively. And that was like an easy, easy one to identify that we were able to fix. Um, that wasn't even a main goal from the partnership. But again, this is going back to mindset and awareness, right? So I definitely saw the benefit of having an administrative assistant that was able to take some things off of my plate and allow me to focus and get some other um, more critical things completed. Great question. There's a question from a little bit earlier that perhaps I think Nisha might be good for you. So if strengthening the board capacity is one of the areas we wanna focus on, what info can we provide the board with regards to their level of commitment? And will the work take place in board meetings or in separate meetings? And Lamont, you may you may have a, an answer to that as well. But Nisha, do you want to speak to that first? Yeah, and Lamont, please jump in because this is um, a specific to if this comes out from the assessment and as we work through your work plan. And so, as it was mentioned before, we're not necessarily consultants coming in to do like a board rehaul or facilitation and retreats, et cetera. But we do help think through what are the steps you should take for reaching your long-term goal of what it might be with the board development. And so it could look like we have come into board meetings to, you know, introduce a self-assessment or work with EDs on understanding roles and responsibilities of board members and where there might be gaps. And so it's really, um, I know this is like a very broad answer and you're probably looking for specific, but it really does focus on what is the work plan, what's the end goal, and what are the resources that you need to meet that end goal. Um, and Laman, nice to see you. I don't know if you have anything to add. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, just to add to that. I think in our case, we had our capacity building specialist, um, who was Suwita at the time, super helpful. She offered to speak to our board. You know, after we got the partnership, uh, she came and joined one of our board meetings just to briefly explain uh, what Fair Chance was about, what we were working on, and how the board could support. And I think that added a lot of clarity. Um, it got people excited because, again, if if you don't know 
exactly what a board is supposed to be doing, it's hard to even explain that to somebody that's never been on a board, right? Mm -hmm. Their responsibilities or how they can be a value add. So that was something that was super helpful. And then even like my board looks completely different from when we started the partnership to now. Um, and a big part of that is even knowing what types of board members to recruit or like where the gaps are. Um, and then you, the last thing I'll add is like, we had a uh, give get, um, but we not everybody on our board was giving. So we were trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we either make it easier for people to give or to help us raise the money or do we need to change our um, donation limit? All of those conversations happen. Um, and in that process, again, it just provides more clarity of what that should look like because it's different for every organization. Um, but that that was definitely an important piece that we uh, worked on during the partnership. Great, thank you, Lamont. Thank you, Nisha. Jeremiah, why don't we go into the application process and tips? Thank you, Lamont, for answering questions and for your time with us today. I know you have other commitments this morning, so please feel free to head out whenever you need to. Uh, thank you again. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Fair Chance team and um, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Lamont. Now we'll go into our application processes and tips. Our application is in depth by design, it has been created to learn as much as possible about your organization and your capacity building needs. I will not go through each section in detail, but I do want to highlight some things that we frequently get questions about. Our application is an online form with intelligent design, so some questions only appear based on how you answered previous questions. In the organizational overview, we ask you to list each of your programs. Please only list your program's names in this section. We will ask for your descriptions of these programs in the next section. Data. If you don't currently collect the data that we are asking about, that is okay. However, the data regarding how many kids you serve that live in poverty and where they are from is data that Fair Chance collects in order to fully understand the impact of our work. Therefore, in order to be a partner, you have to track and share that information in the future. Please take time to really reflect and describe for us your capacity building needs. You can do this by either telling us what you would like to have in place that you do not currently have, or if you don't know what the solution is, you can describe what is not working. For example, you can say that we need a better processes for recruiting new board members, or you can say we have not added new members to the board in several years, and we want to change that. There is also a form for your board chair to complete. It is brief, only one page, and there is a link in the application that you can send to your board chair so that they can access the form and complete it online. When working in board development during the Fair Chance Partnership, at least one member of the board will need to engage with the capacity building specialist. Please be sure to designate who will be the board representative working with Fair Chance during the partnership. Our practice partnership requires each applicant to meet certain eligibility criteria. Some important things to know. You will need a current tax exempt status under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, a mission or at least one program that addresses specific needs of children, youth and families experiencing poverty in Washington, DC, a need for stronger leadership, practices, policies or tools in at least four capacity building areas, at least one program serving children, youth, and families experiencing poverty in Washington, DC, that has been running for a year or longer and will continue running the year following the partnership. 
an executive director who has held the position for at least one year and intends to remain in the position for the duration of the partnership. An executive director who can commit eight hours a week during the partnership to capacity building work, including a weekly two hour meeting with a capacity building specialist held during fair chances business hours from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And you will also need a board director made up of at least <clears throat> five members with a board chair who is not the executive director. Next slide, please. Praxis has two priority considerations that reflect our commitment to our mission in advancing racial equity in the nonprofit sector in DC. At least 50% of the children, youth, and families your organization serves are Washington DC residents who are experiencing poverty. The executive director or a majority of the members of the board of directors, including the board chair, identify as people of color. Note, you can still be a partner even if you don't meet our priority considerations. And just because you meet a priority consideration does not guarantee you will be selected for a partnership. Next slide, please. Okay, I just like to acknowledge that we are at time. It's yep. 10.01. Um, so I, I'm actually not, I, people have been dropping off as they need to. If we need to ask for some additional time, if folks would like to stay on, if we're all able to do that as facilitators. Um, I, uh, and so I just wanna make sure we make that stop. Um, it's one of our, <laughs> one of our values to make sure we're honoring our, uh, honoring time. Um, so. uh, is, is it okay if we, do people wanna stay on and take some more time? I still see folks. I can take more time. And I think since we're going to record and post this, um, you know, regardless of participants or folks who have come to, to hear this information, if you need to drop off, absolutely, please drop off. Um, and just know that we are going to send this recording to you and it's going to be posted. So you will, you will receive the information uh, that you will miss if you're dropping off. Thank you, Sally and Anne. Um, now we will continue to the selection process. After we review all the applications, some organizations will be invited for our interviews, which will be held at the end of March and in April. Our final selections will be made in early May. When you submit your application, you'll be asked to reserve two interview time slots. The first interview is two hours with board with both the ED and the board chair or board representative. And the second interview is 30 minutes and just with the ED. You will be notified in March if your application has advanced to the interview round, which is the short turnaround time is why we are asking you and your board chair or representative to hold the time slot in your application. Who Fair Chance selects for partnership is based on a number of factors. <clears throat> and note, all of these factors have to do <clears throat> with your, with you, excuse me, with you or your application. For example, if the applicant pool this year is really large and fair chance capacity is small, your application may not be successful this year. But we have had organizations that have received a partnership after applying several times. I think there are some question. questions about the priority yeah. uh, considerations that maybe we might want to go back to that before we move yeah. forward. So um, there's just a general, can you clarify about the, the priority considerations? And then a direct question about, we have one person of color out of 12 on our board members. Can we still apply understanding that we won't have priority?
So you can still be a partner, even if you don't meet our priority considerations. And just because you meet a priority consideration does not guarantee you will, you will be selected for a partnership. Hopefully that answers the question. So yeah, yes, you can still apply regardless of how many board members are people of color or not. Absolutely. And you could have no board members of color and it is possible to be awarded a partnership. It's there are a lot of factors that we consider in bringing organizations in as as partners. Um, and we do absolutely consider these things first. Um, and so it's but there's we look at eight different factors in addition to these. And it's it's really very because it's everything is highly customized and highly contextual. Um, and so it's it's um, we really have to see everyone who's applying and, and the slate. And you know, as we've said earlier, we'll have four slots this year. And so the priority considerations help us. Um, so it's not that they don't matter, um, but it is not, it's it's not an eligibility criteria. So the priority is to separate it from what makes you eligible versus you know, what, what will elevate your application. Thank you, Sally, for the clarification. Okay, now we're gonna to move to general tips for completing the application. We hope that our application provides a space for you to reflect on who you are, what you do, and how you want to develop, grow, strengthen, improve, both as an executive director and as an organization. Clarity, we're not looking for buzzwords or fancy prose. We're looking for clarity. The more we understand your organization, programs, and capacity building needs, the better your application will be. Unique. Every nonprofit is special in some way. Help us understand why your organization or program is unique and how you approach your work, who you serve, how you meet an unmet need, or whatever it is that makes your organization great. Concise. This is an in-depth application, so please be concise, but don't sacrifice clarity for consciousness. Make sure we get a good sense of who you are from the application. Transparency. What you tell us in your application is confidential and does not get shared out of our selection team, which is made up of members from Fair Chance's executive team and program staff. So you don't have to hide all your pain points. In fact, we in fact we need you to share those with us to truly understand your capacity building needs. Please remember that you are not applying to Fair Chance for funding, and you do not have to sell a shiny organization with amazing results. In fact, if you are too perfect, we're going to be asking ourselves if you really need a partnership. Another element of transparency is about helping us understand your finances. Having debt and deficiency or cash flow issues does not necessarily reduce your chances of selection. But as I mentioned in the expectations section, our model is not designed to help organizations that are in or in or the brink of financial crisis because our program takes time and requires focusing on multiple areas. And financial crisis usually demands immediate action and singular focus. Therefore, explain your financial situation to us as much as you can, because numbers don't always tell the story, tell the whole story. For example, we partnered with an organization whose funding was very uncertain, but because their programs were run by volunteers and the ED could work without a salary if need be, the organization was going to be able to successfully complete the partnership. Executive leadership focus. The partnership is primarily with the executive director and often the board chair and board. In some cases, we may involve senior staff 
unless you have a strong reason. Example, if you have a larger senior management team, develop your application knowing that you will be the primary focus of the partnership. Now, partnership. Remember that we work with you during a partnership rather than achieving things for you. We help you develop a plan for a website. We do not create websites. In writing about your capacity building needs in the application, emphasize what you want to learn or develop to, to achieve your goals. Are there any questions about anything I've covered? I know that was a lot of information. Thank you for joining. Oh, are there questions now? Sorry, I was just checking, scrolling the chat to make sure we hadn't missed anything. Okay. And I have a very sensitive mouse. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't trying to click a button. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. There was one question which we addressed, uh, but just wanted to state it out loud. Uh, there was a question: Is it completely required that the board chair and ED be separate persons? Um, and yes, that is that is a requirement that you have a separate. You have a board with an established board chair and the executive director who is a different person. Um, there's so that is uh, something we're looking to see. Co board chairs is something we can work with, <laughs> um, but we do need separate people in those roles. All right, let's wrap it up. Yep. Thank you for joining us for this information session. I hope you learned a bit more about Fair Chance, the Praxis Partnership, and if this opportunity is right for you and your organization. As a reminder, we will send out the slideshow and recording for your reference. If you have further questions, please email applications at fairchancedc.org or Sign up to speak with our director of DC programs using the Conley link in the chat box. Thank you and have a wonderful day.